This is what's wild in New Hampshire by wildlife biologist Eric Orff. <laughs> this morning, December 21st, 2021, I'm going to start something different on my YouTube channel. Here I have a book called The History of New Hampshire and Game and Fur Bears. Trust me, it says The History of New Hampshire Game and Fur Bears because I'm doing my camera the other around. Everything's backwards, but I won't read backwards. And what I'm going to start here today is to read sections of, I really consider this the Bible. It has so much awesome information. And why not, as the former New Hampshire Fishing Game Department bear biologist, start out with the history of bears. So here it is, according to Helenette Silvers, a long time, early on, wildlife biologist for the New Hampshire Fishing Game Department. Helenette Silvers did amazing work, and one of them was producing this awesome book called The History of New Hampshire and Game Fur Bears. It's been out of print since the early to mid-50s. Getting a copy is not easy. I have one hardbound copy and one southbound copy. I'm lucky to have them. So let me talk about bears. Here is the history of bears in New Hampshire based on research by Helenette Silvers. The black bear... Arachnus americus americus, originally found in all parts of New Hampshire, now occurs only in the counties of Carroll, Grafton, and Coss. Again, this was written in the 19, early 50s, so bears were infrequently in the western quarter of Merrimack and northern quarter of Belknap counties. And she goes on to list the, uh, the resources, and rarely in other counties. The Indians hunted bear with bow and arrows and took them with snares and in pits. Woods, 1634, wrote that bear was esteemed over venison. Pioneer women of, the New, Hampshire, of New Hampshire used the meat not only for steaks and roasts, but combined with pumpkins for mincemeat. That's Wheeler, 1879. In the history of Coas County, Weeks, 1888, the bear was one of the original proprietors of the soil of this northern country and still holds his own against all odds. I have known him from the little crawling blind cub, not larger than a rat, brought forth in February or the 1st of March to the old sheep killer. Each she-bear produces two and sometimes three cubs, which in their earliest stages are the most insignificant little things imaginable. They fasten upon the mother and for two months draw their sustenance from her while at her partaking of any, of any food. Consequently, she comes out of her den the last of April or the first of May extremely thin, while the cubs are as large as, a wood, as woodchucks. The cubs follow the mother the first season until it's time to den up in the fall when they are driven off and den together. And if they survive, remain each other's, with each other the following season. The latter statement is, is a contradiction to the accepted belief that cubs run with their mothers in their second year, which is true. The adult female breeding uh, once every two years. Weeks continues, if all the cubs and young bears lived, bears would be so numerous that the country would be overrun with them. But I think many perish during the first winter and many more in the spring when they first come out. I have known of several instances where they have found, been found in famished condition and almost helpless. They are, when a year old, not much larger than a collie dog, but they grow very rapidly after vegetation starts. No animals fight for her young with more good will than the bear, and woe to the man or boy or dog that interferes with her cubs. There is no doubt but that large males, bears, kill the smaller ones and each other when they can. The ordinary bear lives mostly on roots, green herbs, berries, seldom killing sheep or doing other mischief. This paragraph, a good account of the habits of New Hampshire bear, furnished by Viren Lowe, formerly a warden with the New Hampshire Fishing Game Department, appears in Randolph Old and New, Cross, 1924. Of all the animals that we have here, the bear is the most sly and retiring. He is very hard to hunt, is in only in years when his food is very scarce that he's seen near the openings at all. Unlike deer, the bear is an animal that follows his feed. 
If there are nuts, he stays home. If not, he goes where there are nuts. Some years there will be lots of bears shot, and other years hardly any. It's not because there are fewer bears, but because they have moved where there is better feeding grounds. Bears live on roots, ants, and the blossoms of different plants in the spring and summer, in the fall on nuts, apples, sometimes on sweet corn, if planted near the woods. They have never been known to attack man unless in defense of their young. They very seldom kill livestock. An old bear will kill young calves or perhaps a sheep, but they get but they get blame for a great many sheep that are killed by dogs. <clears throat> I have been I have seen but two bears that had any white on them. One I shot a long time ago in a small white spot had a small white spot on his rump. The other I got in the fall of 1923, it had a large white spot in the center of her breast. This was the only female with two cubs, but they showed no white. Of seven bears that I shot in the fall of 1923, this was the largest, weighing about 250 pounds. It can readily be seen that they are not very big bears. In the spring, when the bears first come out of the den, there is very little for them to eat. If you take the trouble to follow them, you will find that they do not go back to the winter den once they have left it. You will also find that wherever they spend a night, they take the trouble to build a regular bough bed. They will climb up a small fir or spruce, break off, a off branches, and pile them in a hollow which they have scooped out of the snow. The branches really are arranged in a very systematic way, tips all pointing in. I have seen several of these beds, and they are all made the same. If there are two bears, there will be two beds. Bears are very easy to approach when they are eating. I have driven my car to within 300 feet of them, then got out, walked near enough to kill him with a shotgun. I have known them to walk between two men who were not over 50 feet apart, but when they are done eating, they are very alert and almost impossible to still hunt. To still hunt them. Sometimes on good soft snow you may be able to do, do it, but the chances are against you. Bears are very destructive to cornfields and, and the flocks of herds of the settlers. At Dover, one of the very earliest towns, the pioneers hired Indians to kill bears and wolves. Leonard and Seward, 1920. Essentially a forest animal, the bear retreated before the destruction of its range. In most of the open settled countries, they were pretty well thinned out in the southern half of the state by the opening of the 19th century, but lingered around some of the mountains there until well after this date. In Rockingham County, they were occasionally seen up to 1810, and more than two decades later, there were sufficient numbers in Merrimack County to be quite destructive. Bears were commonly seen around Boston and Webster until about 1815, probably arranging in the vicinity of Kearsarge Mountain. They inhabited the Ragged Mountain near Andover, where in 1834, the last year which they were troublesome, 20 sheep were killed in one night. Bear were common in Hillsborough County up until the early part of the 19th century. The last one was reported killed in the town of Ware in 1824. Occasionally one was taken in Cheshire and Sullivan County up to 1880. In the three northern counties, Grafton, Carroll, and Coos, bears have always been common. The country round Albany was said to have been particularly good bear country, and these animals were so plentiful in Pittsburgh at the time of the settlement that it was practically impossible to keep sheep. Hoover unpublished. In fact, this is still the case according to two old-time hunters of the town, both in their late 80s. They believe bear to be about as numerous as they were when they were boys. So... The original density of bears is estimated at about one to every five square miles, Stevens, 1943. Judging from the local history, this seems rather low, but they may have been a good many less bears than their earlier r residents figured. A single bear, if it is, has its mind to, it can do a good deal of damage. The settlers expected to, to be surrounded by bears, and they saw that even when they wasn't when they weren't there, there was a good proof that this is a historical instance of farmers blazing away at their own black sheep and cattle by mistake. A few of the old bear hunters are said to have made good living from their bounties, but this is difficult to understand unless the expenditures for bounties records have not been preserved or far greater 
were far greater before 1861 than were at later dates. If it were really possible to live off the bounties, this argues in favor of very high bear population considering the low cost of living. The results of the number of big community hunts when a ring of men encircling the area produced nothing but small game or at the most a single bear indicates the density was relatively low. Based on the limited numerical data available on the status of bear in New Hampshire in 1943, Stevens made some interesting calculations. Assuming a population of one bear to every five square miles, using the reported kill for the years 1934 to 1942, he calculated the bear population at the end of this period at recruitment of about 10% to 20%. Some of this resulted, results showed bear being killed after they had, in theory, been ex ex exterminated. Throwing out these obvious impossible hypotheses, then he, then he, he then ch chose by elimination what he considered the most probable figure for the bear population in, in 1943. So in 1943, he estimated there were 837 bears, 837 bears in 1943 pointing out that the bears have been ex extirpated or exterminated over most of their original range, Stevens predicted that the rapid ex extermination of New Hampshire's bears unless radical changes in regulations were made. New Hampshire bear population was estimated by both Harper and Seton in 1929 at 1,000 and, and people 1942 uh, was the, uh, and people considered it at the time to be about two thirds of the Aboriginal population. If he had, if he refers to the density of the, of the populated range, this is probably quite correct. However, if he means the number of bears present in 1942 was two thirds of the original population, he must be in error. Since at time of settlement, all of New Hampshire was bear country, while present bear range is practically limited to half the area. The latter in interpretation would mean that 67% of the original numbers of bears occupied in 1942, 50% of their original range, an increase in density of 34%. Considering the low reproductive capacity of bears and the lack of any regulations on hunting them, it has not been difficult to predict ultimate doom. Nevertheless, it has not worked out that way. The bears linger on and, and is apparently more than holding its own. From 1882, when a breakdown of bounty payments first became available to the present. The numbers annually presented for payment had gone up and down, but without but, but without wild fluctuations. Reported bear kills for the year 1882 through 1956 are given on table, table X10. This table contains many inaccuracies, dates representing the time when the towns were reimbursed by the straight treasurer rather than the dates of the kill, and is based on physical rather than cal fiscal rather than calendar years. <laughs> Between 1914 and 1917, an undetermined number of grasshoppers got mixed in with the bears. This odd combination arrived from the loose classification employed in making legislative appropriations. It was not to be serious. It was not to be serious at its first appearance. By night by 1914. Grasshopper picking had lost its appeal, and we shall not, and we shall not be too far out of the way if we guess that about a hundred bears were bounded annually. So about a hundred bears, or estimated to be bounded between 1914 and 1917, because they mixed in the grasshopper bounty with it. The figure for 1924 through 1927 are also open to sus suspicion. Treasury reports for this period give only the sums expended. While it would have seemed easy to arrive at the number of bears by dividing the, the expenditures of the amount of the bounty, the fact that the payments exactly equal appropriations for both porcupines and bears might lead to a conclusion that legislative appropriations have been remarkably stable, stabilizing effects on animal population. One thing we, we may be sure of, bounties were not paid on the number greater than in the, sh in the shown table. And the true kill may be somewhat less for those years. On the other hand, many hunters in recent years have not bothered to collect the $5 bounty. And the actual kill 
have sometimes been considerably higher than the numbered bounty. With all these sources of error, the table gives some ind indication of fluctuations in the bear kill for a period of over 70 years. Harvests for the early 1930s, which, which, with which Stevens worked on, on, are seen to be unusually high. The department in 1934 reported bear on the increase, and the years 1934 to 1936 produced the highest kills on record to date. Coupled with the decrease that naturally followed, these figures were enough cause to alarm, but nothing very spectacular happened. The latest available figures seem to show <coughs> there are about as many bears as there ever have been in recent times. One was killed in Sullivan County in 1940. A second was killed in that county in the town of Lempster in December of 1950. There were signs of bear in Corbin Park in 1953, and Conservation Officer Jeff Scott reported there were more bear tracks in nearby territory than he could remember. In Cheshire County, Conservation Officer John Martin observed one in the Pitcher Mountain area of Stoddard in 1951. Officer George Stevens and Roger Warren reported bears working among apples and choke turries in the same area in 1953. One was seen at the junction of Honey Brook and Cold River in Ackworth earlier the same fall. In 1954-55, season produced a record kill, attributing not so much to an increase in the bears, but as a failure of the mass and blueberry crops. Food shortages brought bears into the open to be observed almost anywhere in the state. They annoyed farmers in Rockingham and Merrimack counties when one was shot in the town of Boston while robbing a beehive. New Hampshire people have always reckoned bears an enemy. <coughs> it has never been a closed season there, never, there has never been a closed season. It has been almost as popular a subject for bounties as the wolf. For example, the list of state bounties. Nevertheless, the number of bears seems always to have been in good balance with the available habitat. Further destruction of habitat is not imminent, and their position is perhaps as secure as any species in the state. Removal of the bounty sh should have a small tendency to increase population and the continuation of a body equally little effect in controlling them. For many years, the department vainly tried to interest the public in declaring the bears a game animal, a state which has a population of black bears and a habitat suitable bear production is fortunate indeed. The bear is a favorite animal of the big game hunter because of its cunning and agility, and cunning and ability, agility and a bear population, if handled properly, will bring a high revenue to the state from those who are willing to pay for the pillage of hunting them. Likewise, the bear responds well to even a slight amount of protection and may be hunted year after year without depleting their brood stock. A department sponsored bill clo closing the season between September 1 and November 1 passed the House in 1955. It was aimed not only at protecting bears, but increasing the department's income through the sale of special non-resident bear licenses. No sooner had it received the, appeal, the approval of the House than reports of bear damage began to come in. A number of cattle were killed in the vicinity of Lyman and Monroe, and others were clawed as they died, so they died. All the killings were charged to a single 450-pound male, which is credited with destroying at least 27 counties, cows within, within two years' time. After this, an animal was tracked down and shot on May, on May 23rd. The killing ceased, but even male bears were shot and trapped on the same area before the killer was taken. The females and cubs up to date had not come out of their wintering areas. The department weighed the possible damage settlement against the expected revenue for bear licenses and reversed its stands. Bill was killed in the Senate, but another which substituted damage payments for Bonnie was passed from August Fifth, when the law became effective. So January 1956, roughly half the fiscal year, 12 claims uh, amounted to slightly over $1,300. And that is the end of the bear section. Let me open up the uh, table here and see if, well, it's going to be backwards, so that won't work. Anyways, uh, 1882, 80 bears were bounty. 1883, 68. 1907, 49 bears were bounty. The lowest number of bears in this list, very there's a few over 100, most are under 100, 
1933, only 13 bears were bountied. Uh, 1934, 310. Remember, the, the bear population was had an upswing. 310 in 1934, 258 in 35, and 248. But then back down, 99, 50, 30, 30 bears in 1939. So during the Great Depression, when a 5 to $20 bounty, and the bounty varied, you know, 5 or $20 was a lot of money. And uh, only, uh, you know, a dozen bears killed for the bounty in 1933. Uh, 1956, 119 bears were bounties were paid. Oh, that is Helena Silvers, the history of New Hampshire game and fur bears. Helena Silver, 19 uh, May 1957, it was published. Oh, that is the history of bears in New Hampshire, according to the history of New Hampshire game and fur bears.